Thank you. Be seated. Hey, please report, Your Honor. This is case 2023-06-2034, State of Ohio v. Daniel Schanenberger. Mr. Schanenberger is present today in the courtroom. Uh, his counsel, uh, Michael Administer, uh, is present via video remote. Can you spotlight him, please, Shay? She'll put him up there. We are all seeing Mr. Administer at this time in the courtroom. Uh, we also have Eric Jones, who is not uh, assigned counsel in this case, but he was requested to be present since Mr. Administer is out of the state and was not going to be available today to be in the courtroom for this hearing. Uh, right, so and I understand that that was through no fault of Mr. Administer, that he was, he knew he was going to be out of state, but other incidents have occurred that have prevented him from being here. And we, out of deference to the family, we decided to go forward and he asked if we could just proceed by Zoom and the board agreed under these circumstances. So, um, the other thing I want to say before we proceed, however, is I do understand how uh, difficult a case like this is for uh, not only for the victim's families, but also for the defendant's family. I understand there's a lot of high emotions in cases like this. Um, and people are going to be speaking. All I ask is if you are speaking to remember that you are in a courtroom. You certainly have the right to speak and convey whatever you wish to convey to either the court or to the defendant himself. Um, but just please keep in mind that you are in a courtroom and there's no, there has to be a certain level of decorum that is um, followed. And then also when it gets to the point of sentencing, it's important that there are no outbursts or uh, displays of emotion. Once again, if you feel like you cannot abide by those rules, then you're going to have to step out of the courtroom or the deputies will ask you to leave. And I'm sure you want to keep me here to support your loved ones and you don't want to miss anything. So I'm hopeful that everyone will be uh, mindful of that. Also, with the addition, other than the, with the exception of the, the, of the press, who are here with the permission of the court and signed written permission of the court. No one else is to have their cell phones on. So no one in the back should be recording this. Um, so lawyers can have their phones on silence, but in the back, all cell phones must be turned off and put away. And if we see a cell phone, it will be confiscated. Everyone needs to remove their hats as well. All right. I think we're ready to go, Mr. Bowell. Do you have some um, people that you would like to have speak if so they can step up to this Thank mic? You, Your Honor, let me first, I, I would like for the record, though, uh, to, to You want to say something first? Go ahead. I do, but I also want to make sure that Mr. Schamberger understands the, uh, I guess, the procedures of having his counsel be a video remote and that he is, he is willing to go forward under these circumstances. Yes. I, can I can represent the court that I met with Mr. Schamberger via IC Solutions this morning. Uh, I've uh, notified his family, and he's indicated to me that he does agree to proceed under these circumstances. Is that true, Mr. Schamberger? Yes, All right, thank you. And thank you, Judge. Again, as you did indicate, um, there was no trial in this matter. The defendant did plead no guilt. No contest and was found guilty of one count of aggravated vehicular homicide and one count of aggravated vehicular assault, along with a misdemeanor count of, of operating the vehicle while impaired. Um, I did have a chance to review the pre-sentence investigation. Unfortunately, I don't believe that an investigation or that written document really portrays um, what happened back on March 14th of 2023 at 8 30 in the morning. So, I think to understand and to put it in context what uh, family members and loved ones are going to tell you, I think this court needs to be presented with some of the evidence and some of the facts in this case as to, to what occurred that morning. And when we talk about that event, and, and you know, unfortunately in this court we, we often use the terms of tragedy um, and senselessness, um, but this case took those words of tragedy, senselessness, uh, horrific nature of this case um, 
not only the evidence, but the consequences and the results of the actions of the defendant that day uh, took those words uh, to, a, to a new height, unfortunately, and to a, a, a degree um, that is just heartbreaking. Um, because this case involves two victims, uh, one being Christina Williams, who did suffer injuries but survived the event, but Tashana Junius, 33 years old, um, died as a result of the defendant's conduct that day. And I, and I kind of want to go over the events of that day because it was Tashana, and I think you'll hear from her family members as I've heard and have seen letters about what a special, special lady this was um, and what a great loss she is not only to her family members, her loved ones, but, but to this community and to this world. And, and on that morning, she was doing what she did. She was taking care of her daughter, uh, dropping her off at school, um, and heading to work. And I'll start out, if I could, you can provide access to, to the docu cam here on it. And I'll start out with two photographs showing to Shana, which are going to be presented uh, this is to Sean here, and then this is another picture of to Sean with her daughter, Melrose, who she had just dropped off at the William Ryder Learning Center on Manchester Road. And that is kind of an elementary school, and this is something she did every morning. Uh, it should also be known that Christina Williams had just dropped off her kids at school as well. So if there's any, I guess, positive note from any of this that happened that morning is that those children were not in the car when this occurred because it would be just moments after dropping these children off that this event occurred. To give you perspective of what was happening that morning, these are some Google Maps photographs. And this first shows a perspective of coming out of the school school driveway, and straight ahead is Manchester Road. And so Tashana would have gone up to that light as with Christina Williams and taken a left onto Manchester Road. It was at that intersection this is a closer up of that intersection here that the light facing Manchester Road would have been red and the defendant would have pulled up and stopped at that intersection. And it just so happened that Detective Brian Breeden of the Sheriff's Office, who this, this court has seen before as a lead detective in, in some of the cases that have gone to trial in this case, but he also was pulling up to that intersection as well. He would later provide a written statement indicating that he, he noticed kind of the unusual actions of the defendant and that although the defendant had no cars in front of him, he didn't stop at that big solid white line where he would usually stop. He in fact stopped about four car lengths behind that. And that immediately brought Mr. Shannonberger to the attention of Detective Breeden at that time. When the light turned green, he took off, and that would have been a school zone at that point, but as Detective Breeden put it, he said, when the light cycled the green, the Ford accelerated through the school zone, traveled the northbound. The Ford continued to increase speed as it approached traffic stop at the light at Manchester and Welcome. The Ford slammed into a black Kia, and the black Kia was the car in which Tashana was the, the driver. Without activating the brake lights, the collision ejected the driver of the Kia into the passenger side of the vehicle. When we look again one last time at a Google map, you can see the short distance. 2370 is the address of the school, traveling northbound, and the collision occurred at 2200 Manchester Road. By Google accounts, uh, that's only four tenths of a mile, in which the defendant went from a red light stop to accelerating through a school zone accelerate right into the vehicle of Tashana. The 
investigation in this case was excellent. One of the things that the investigators were able to obtain was an airbag control module. Um, and although the speed limit on that road is 35 miles per hour, the airbag speed module from the defendant's vehicle showed that he was traveling at a speed of 59 miles per hour. That same module showed that he never braked, not even slightly, as he collided and rammed into Tishana's car, and that he did not in any way turn the steering wheel in an attempt to avoid that vehicle. <clears throat> when police would arrive on the scene, they would ultimately photograph In one of the photographs and the white car in the forefront. That is the white Impala, a 2008 white Impala, which was driven by Christina Williams. And so this court understands, and I'm going to show the video, but when the defendant slammed into the back of Tashana's vehicle, Tashana then, her car was forced into the vehicle of Christina Williams and with such force that it caused extreme damage to her car as well. So you see in the forefront of Christina's car, the black Kia, Mr. Sean's car, and then the defendant was driving a maroon Taurus. Closer look at these vehicles. This is the back of Tashana's car. This is the back of Tashana's car in the front of the defendant's vehicle. And then finally, this is the back of Christina Williams. And the damage alone tells you that this was a violent collision. Um, and ultimately, uh, uh, Tashana died as a result of, of that trauma. Um, but the video itself, um, which is difficult to watch, but I think it's imperative for this court to see the video, but one of the establishments that was parked right across the street had a security video camera which caught the collision uh, camera and I'd like to play that for you at this time. No, you might want to try pressing the button on the Ryan. Well, if it's ready, then there, go. there we go. Okay. So this is the uh, camera view outside uh, of the establishment. And I will stop it just so that you can uh, kind of orient the court in regards to Christina Williams' car, as well as Tashana's car. You can see Christina Williams' car pulling up there, and that will be Tashana's car right behind it. So you can see the white car is Christina Williams' car, and the black Kia is Tashana's car. So you see through the still pictures and through this video how violent that collision was. Uh, once again, this is occurring at 8.30 in the morning on a school day.
police were equipped with body-worn cameras. Um, and so uh, while most of the focus initially was, was to provide aid to Tashana uh, and Christina, the police also then came into contact with Mr. Schenneberger and placed him into the cruiser. And I want to show the court just the beginning of that contact. Should be volume on this chip, so bear with me. Oh, it's not on this. No. Let me go out and go back in and see if that makes a difference. Probably have to press that button. It's flashing red, so you do that tell if you're in the process of connecting. There we go.
which would have been approximately two hours after the collision. And in that sample, we find cocaine, we find heroin, we find fentanyl, we find morphine, we find norfentanyl and acetylfentanyl, marijuana, and hydrocodone. He fails field sobriety tests there at the scene. He fails field sobriety tests in the, uh, in the police department. But maybe most telling, as to how under the influence he had gotten that morning are videos from the police station after all the testing is done, um, after, uh, after he's just waiting to be picked up from the police department. And I'm going to show you a couple of clips from this. This is the traffic bureau area of the Akron Police Department. This is after the interview, after the field sobriety test. I'm going to fast forward to two minutes on this. And I ask you to keep close attention to the defendant and his physical mannerisms in this case as to how truly out of it this individual was. And this is about two and a half hours after the collision. This man was driving on the streets individuals, individuals with kids, and it's just shocking to see how impaired he truly was. Jumping ahead to the 9 minute and 55 second mark. Have one more minute of this video.
Judge, that's just a small sampling of what we see in Mr. Schanberg. And I wanted to give the court the idea as to the impairment um, that he was under that morning. I wanted to give the court an idea of specific facts um, which resulted in this tragedy. Um, and now I want to give an opportunity to the family um, and, and loved ones of Tashana to address this court in regards to this case. Let's have them step up here, and then if you could please state your name, spell spell your name, and indicate your relationship to to Sean. Or harder than you think um, to be up here because no one's supposed to bury their child. For a whole year, it's nothing but a nightmare for my family. You don't understand what you have taken away from me, what you have taken away from a five-year-old little girl. Our mom was her world. She did everything for that little girl. I have not slept since March 14th, 2023. I have lost weight. It's hard for me to, to function because she took my best friend. To get a call like that. get a call saying that your loved one has passed. You can never understand. You can never understand that unless you've been through it. And you took that from me, from your actions. You have never took accountability for taking my daughter from me from taking a five-year-old daughter, I mean mother, away from her daughter. She was a nurse. She graduated from Kent State. She was a dental assistant. She was an ordained minister. She, was, she had just obtained her realtor's license. She had property. You took all that away from her. She was coming to be greater than she was already, and you took that away from her, from your actions. And it's not gonna do it. You have no idea. When I told my granddaughter, her mom was, she was never gonna see her mom again. The cry that she had came out of her mouth. It was a cry I had lived with every single day. To hear she's never going to see her mom again. She's never going to see her on St. Patrick's Day, on Valentine's Day. She's never going to get to read her bedtime story anymore. You took that from me. I have no words to say other than you. It should have been you. It should have been you. And not her. I have, I have no words. I have no words. Thank you. Thank you.
name is Sashay, last name Carter, C-A-R-T-E-R. Now, can you say how you know and Tashana? Me and Tashana were friends, our friends still, even after this. Um, I wrote a letter and I know it was sent to you as well. But even after viewing the video, my emotions are all over the place again. So I'm gonna try to keep it as simple as possible. Trying to find the appropriate words to say to the man who has taken my friend away has been quite difficult for me. Reopening a wound that is trying to heal peacefully has not been possible until he is sentenced and we get the justice that we need. March 14th, 2023 changed a lot of our lives. Tashana was a great mother, a great daughter, a great sister, and a great friend who was suddenly taken away due to someone who was so irresponsible, did not think of his actions when he decided to get in that car. I met Tashana when I was 11 years old. I'm 34 now. We've been friends since middle school. Always kept in touch. We didn't have to hang around each other every day, but we talked all the time. I never thought that I would be here today asking for a fair justice system due to a reckless, selfish, not thinking of the consequences a person could impact on all of our lives, all of our friends, all of our family, our child. My friend is long gone, never coming back. And all we have as friends and family is now memories while her killer gets another chance at life. His family can still communicate with him, come visit him, enjoy laughs, tell them they love him, tell him jokes, send pictures, touch, hug, reminisce on good times, all the things I could do with my friend, I can no longer do. Her family can no longer do. Her daughter could no longer do. I go through my phone all the time and listen to our voice recordings between us. And it makes me think how I don't get to see my friend age out. We don't get to talk about our kids like how we used to. Our kids were super close in age. We were the last ones to have kids at our age. All of our other friends had children already. And I'm gonna miss that. Accountability is all that we're asking today. I keep asking God, why did he choose her to be one of his angels so soon? Why not take the person who caused all this hurt and pain on our lives? My friend did not deserve to lose her life because of someone not caring how their day would go. I understand addiction because I work with addiction patients. But that's a choice, it's not a need. Tashana has so much going for herself. She loved her baby Melrose to death. She hugged and kissed her baby, leaving at school not knowing that would be her last time. Tashana meant so much to us and it's not fair. So I'm pleading today that her killer receives the max sentence, even though the time is still not what is deserved. Under this understanding the laws, of course. Not only did he take a pure soul, he has caused damage with a baby growing up without her mother. And we all understand motherly love. It's so hard to look at my friend's baby girl without the throat feeling like a lump is in it. I appreciate the time. It took you to read my letter if you did get the chance to read it to understand how we felt. And I put it as appropriate as I could for the courts.
because I can say so much more. But you really took a good friend from me, someone I've been knowing for a long time, someone that did not deserve it. You could have went a different direction. You did not have to get in that car that day. She just wanted to, wanted to be a mom to her child. Now it's another child without a mother. And it's not fair. It's not fair at all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carter. My name is Candace Sales, S-A-L-E-S. I am Tashana's child and friend. Uh, we have known each other since sixth grade. We graduated nursing school together. She was my son's godmother. My son is 15 years old. And because of you, my son is scared to drive. My son do not like to get behind the wheel. My son even wanna come today because of you. You have to a lot from us. Tashana was in my wedding. To shout out at every milestone with me. We could go months without talking. And we could talk right back like we never left. It was four of us. It was Tashana, it was Stephanie, and when it was Brooklyn, and it was myself. You took on our closest friends. You took everything from us. Tashana was a mother, she was a great nurse. When it came to your credit, she wanted you to do everything good. And you really took everything because of your actions. And because I'm a nurse, I take care of people like you every day. And it, it kills me because I have to have this nurse mentality. But in reality, I really dislike you. You took a lot from us. I was working that day when I got the call that you took my best friend. I had to call and tell my son that his godmother is gone. Today is my birthday. I'm supposed to be having fun with my friend somewhere. Waking up to her messages, a happy birthday candy girl. But you took that away. I would say that I forgive, but you, you have a lot more that you wanna fight with. The rest of your life, you gonna have to think about what you did. It's never gonna go away. No matter how many times you repent, how many times you pray, your family get to call you, your family get to talk to you, your family get to video call, they get to visit. If you have kids, they get to see you. Melrose don't have that. You get to come back home and start another life. Why all of us don't have that? I have just memories of pictures, videos of her little squeaky voice. And we don't have that. I just really hope that you sit, you think about what you took. I hope that your family understand what you have done. And I hope that they embarrassed by you. Tashana was a good person. And I just really hope that even with the max sentence, it's not gonna give, give, you know, give her back to us. That's, that's a lifetime. Her mother have to look at pictures. It's, it's no longer to shot on butter. Like, it's, it's no longer that. Them tears is just so irritating, but that's all.
my name. That's why you should turn her. Can you tell me your name again? Maisha Turner. Turner? And how do you know her father? Um, Tashada's first um, niece, first everything at this point. Um, I don't know what to say, because I've never in a million years thought I'd be doing something like this. I can't even look at you, because you ain't even saying nothing to us. I'm not sorry, nobody, nothing, just not even apologize, because you can't even get her back. I'm so angry. It's okay. <laughs> she meant the world to me, <laughs> like everything. I could go to her about anything. I was with her that Saturday. And then you sit here crying like you care. You don't. I can't. My name is Kiana Moore. I'm Tashana's sister. Sister? Her sister? <clears throat> um, I had this whole light speech and letter written out to try to prepare. <laughs> sister was so special to us and she loved her daughter she loved her family she loved her friends the last time I saw my sister she came and got her hair done a weekend before this accident happened I was, the last time I saw her was in my salon and I did her hair Tell me how proud she was of me. <laughs> she told me she loved me and she was happy I was doing what she knew I was good at. <laughs> and to get that call three days later, I'm at work. I can hear it in my mom's voice that something was wrong. <laughs> She said, Momo got to an accident. I'm like, okay. I'm about to go see her. I'm about to go to work. I'm about to leave work. Just for her to stop me in my tracks and tell me that she was killed. By someone that was so, so senseless. That was so careless. 
It was heartless. Because for you to be that impaired, to get behind the wheel, you did not care about your own life. You didn't care about your kids. You didn't care about your family. <laughs> if I could just push my sister's car the other way. <laughs> if I could just make her go another route. If she could have overslept anything, I try to think of anything. I love my sister to death. She was always there. Right or wrong, she was always there. I had to buy Melrose a blanket. A blanket with her picture of her, her mom on there. Cause she never killed her, her mom again. We left with depression, anxiety, a sleepless night. I took two months to even get back in the car. Because I'm paranoid. I really wish life was on the table for this man. Because at this point, it's life for a life to me. The time that he is even offered is never enough. It's never enough. This man has no show, no type of compassion, and no type of remorse. And I ask that whatever the highest it can be. They deserve every last bit of it. Every last bit of it. Thank you. Aisha Brown, I'm her best, 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 best friend. Um, I wrote on my phone, is that okay? Yes, just, she has to take down what you're saying so don't read it too quickly, okay? Okay. <sighs> mm. Role model, definition, a person looked to by others as example to be imitated. Role model, someone with strong, strongest matches, a good example, a hero, an idol, a superstar. Best friend, definition, someone you can trust with your life who has been who has seen the best and the worst of you and will be there whenever you need someone to talk to. Where do I start? You took a role model from me. You took a true best friend. She was a superstar. She was a daughter who you would be proud to have. Her accomplishments, her goals, she made, she made her mother so proud. 
an amazing, gracious, honorable mother, to her only daughter, Melrose, a deserving, fearing, wisdom, trustworthy sister, a goddaughter, truly from God, the impact you have caused, the hurt, the pain, the disgrace, the unbearable loss, the heart, shattered. You have caused her family so much pain, myself, especially her beautiful, joyful daughter, Melrose. You have no idea, no clue how much important Tashana was, how much she was loved, how much she was just one phone call away. She meant the world to me and everyone in her life. She was the type of person you want by your side. When you have financial problems, she would fix it. How much of her advice and the right advice she would give to her loved ones that matter. <sighs> My best friend Deshauna mattered. She mattered. To not get that one phone call away, to not hear her wisdom of words, the truth, the honesty she believed, as perfect as she was to me. You have took something from me. You took my heart. You took my heart. You took my heart. You took my peace. You took the only thing that mattered in this world. You took that one call away from me. I will never, ever get back. I have to be strong, being her best friend. The one who was there at all of her daughter's birthday parties, her Christmases, her Thanksgivings, front and center. I am that friend who talked to her about her. So much highly in respect for my love, dear friend Tashana. Her laugh. Her laugh. I miss her laugh so much. I miss her laugh. Waking up every morning, and I mean every morning, saying good morning, beautiful. I bought her roses because she meant that much to me. I bought her roses every couple months. She was that special to me. I didn't need a reason just because, just because she was that much to me. I wanted to see her smile. I wanted to feel how much I truly loved and adored her. I would brag about how independent and beautiful her mind was. I would brag to everyone how much her goals she accomplished, how determined, dedicated she was. She finished everything she worked for. And I mean everything she worked for. Her nursing degree, her real estate license, she got it. My best friend was, she was dope. She was the most selfless person I had ever met in my life. She was pure diamond, a God's angel. It breaks me. I have to. I have to look into her mother's eyes. And every time I talk to her, I can feel the pain, the loss of her amazing daughter not being in her life. All I can do is make mommy laugh to cheer her up. Can you imagine looking into Shana's mother's eyes? Her daughter, Melrose? Because I do, as her best friend. And I bet you can't. You have not once did. But me, her best friend, looks at them with sorrow, with burden, with the pain that I had. I'm her best friend. She was my everything. She was a light in the sky. She was a fresh coffee in the morning. She helped me in so many ways as a mother of four. She has taught me to be the best and do the best every single day. My best friend Tashana strive for greatness because she was great. She was great. God made her that way. I wish it was a dream. I wish I just, I just wish it never happened to my best friend. Due to your senseless actions, 
your sense of cowardly actions, you have cost that one phone call away. For me, for her brother, her mom, her sisters, her best friends, importantly her daughter Melrose, who she gave, who she gave the world to, who she cherished and made her an even better woman. Melrose is her pride and joy. She is the kindest, sweetest little girl. I'm doing good. <laughs> she remembered everything about her mother when she would read books to her. <laughs> when she would read books to her, lay next to her every night. Melrose is an image of her mother and I'm so grateful to be a part of her life. But to know that she will remember laying in her bed with her mom, how her mom's smell and touch was, to know she cannot get that back breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. Got a little bit left. Okay. Jesus. I want you to remember every day of your life, you get to live on this earth while my baby and her family suffer the loss of Tashana. I want to say to her mother and her brother, I truly love you both for accepting me in your lives, for letting me be a part of your family, for loving me and calling on me. You have no idea how much it means to me. The last we shared, the meals we ate together as family. Mom, my dearest mom, I love you. I love you more because you brought Tashana into this world. Without you, there wouldn't be her. There wouldn't be the friendship we shared. Mom, I want you to know, be proud of Tashana because one day I'll look up to you and Tashana and pray that me and my teenage daughter will grow into an independent daughter like yours. <laughs> you all mean so much to her. She loves you. She loves you, Marcus. She wanted you to understand everything she taught you because she might not always be a call away. She wanted to push you as hard as she could because that's what big sisters do. She always believed in you. You always wanted, she always wanted you to find something. You love, you stack your money, take care of your boys, and become the independent man she called her brother, her confidant. I know the bond you two share firsthand. She was your brother, she was your mother, your best friend. And I know she's gone, but you have to stay strong because that's all she wanted from you. Don't fold when it's pressure and don't fall because she is not around. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that this has happened to her. The last time we hung out was before she passed away and we had a ball. We had a ball. <laughs> Then you took something from me and this family, and she was important, and she was loved. You just looked at her and wanted to be her. You just wanted to be her. And she meant that much to me. She meant so much to me. And I wish she wouldn't have done that. Aisha Brown, I'm signing off. Thank you. Thank you. On March.
March 14th, 2023, our lives changed forever. On that morning, a man, a scientist, with a college degree in a world of opportunities, woke up and decided to get doped up on various drugs and decided to get behind the wheel of his car. It was on this same day, our sister, daughter, and friend Tashana woke up and got her daughter Melrose ready for a great day at school and also got into her car to drop her off. She strapped Melrose into her car seat so she would be safe and dropped her off at Reimer Elementary, expecting to pick her up later that day, never knowing that this would be the last time that Melrose would see her mother alive and the last time Tishana would see her only child. Tishana would be killed a few moments later when she left her daughter's school while waiting for a red light to change at 8.30 in the morning. Killed by a scientist, Daniel Schanenberger, who was under the influence of a cocktail of substances, any of which could have killed him. But instead, he and his substances killed Tashana, our sister, her parents' daughter, Meryl's mother. You rear-ended Tashana at such a high rate of speed that you killed her within an hour of the accident. And injured the woman in the car in front of you. You hit her so violently that Tashana's car, which was stopped, hit the stopped car in front of her, throwing her body, causing it to absorb all of the shock of the impact, ultimately causing her to die of a broken neck and fatal blunt injuries so bad she was unable to survive despite timely life-saving measures. The traumatic injuries that you caused made her choke on her blood suffering alone, in pain, until her last moments on this earth. You did not give her a chance. And the irony is, you took multiple drugs and drove, yet she died and you got to live. Today, you will know the incredible life you stole from us. On March 14, 2023, I walked into the hospital and Tashana's brother Marcus told me she was gone. He couldn't breathe. He could barely talk. This is singularly the worst day of all of our lives. Her mother will never be the same she has lost weight, and she still cries daily. Her daughter <clears throat> talks about her mother every single day as if she's alive and tells any stranger she can that her mother has died and was taken from her. It is heartbreaking. Her siblings and friends are still in shock as Tashana was the nicest, most caring person in this world. There are no words to describe the turmoil, the pain, and the uncertainty of the last year of our lives without Tashana. Nothing has been the same. Our happiness, our peace of minds, our view on the world as has been negatively impacted every, every day since we were told she would never wake up, walk, talk, hug, 
or love again. Her infectious laughter, her logical and helpful advice, her positive, ambitious, and motivated attitude to achieve success no longer seen and heard. She was the most supportive person with the kindest and caring soul, a college-educated woman, a business owner, elevating in her career, a dedicated and loving mother gone way too fast and way too soon. There is not a day that goes by that we don't look at her photos, visit places we used to go, look at her belongings where we don't feel that same pain all over again. A continuous cycle of heartache and disbelief. The pain of losing someone so innocent and undeserving of the death she endured is unfathomable. She was a loving mother with a beautiful daughter who simply was being a phenomenal mother that she strived to be taking her child to school to learn and grow only to be taken from her life in the most disturbing and tragic way imaginable. It brings tears to our eyes when we see her daughter Melrose growing and maturing and her mother is missing it all. And she is always missing her mother. She didn't even get a chance to say goodbye. None of us got to be there in her final moments. And the thought of how she suffered until her last breath weighs heavy on us each and every day. And the trauma of this ordeal is always present. It's been a struggle coming to terms with Tashana being ripped from our lives so violently and trying to find peace while navigating the court system and expecting justice for her homicide. It has been mentally draining and emotionally challenging. From the moment you viciously crashed into her, we have been pushing and crying for justice only to go on for a year with delays, adding more heartbreaking moments because of your unwillingness to take full accountability for your actions that took away a human being forever. We have never heard any expressions of remorse in your actions or in your words. You've pushed back this issue with excuses and stall tactics, knowing that you hold full and complete responsibility. No one in your family has expressed concern, sympathy, or condolences, even though we've sat in this very courtroom and have walked by each other several times. The lack of simple humanity is sour in our hearts. It is not lost on us the severity of these offenses and how severely they have impacted the lives of every person who loved Tashana. This should have never happened and she should be here. We can't fathom how you are a scientist with a college degree, someone who should have known better could have such a lack of concern for the regards of others. You are ultimately the reason why we continually grieve today and why we will be grieving for the rest of our lives. Tashana didn't deserve this, and we will not rest easy unless we know the maximum punishment is imposed in this case. She would never get a second chance at life. And we believe that it's not justice if you get anything under the max. The defendant deserves that time ripped from his life in exchange for the life he ripped away from us. With his fatal disregard to take drugs and operate his car that morning. A max sentence might not heal the pain and the hurt that we have been feeling and will continue to feel. But it will let us know that her life was valued to this system. And then we can close this chapter knowing that he has received the highest punishment for his crimes. Judge McCarty, we are asking you to give Daniel Shannonberger the maximum sentence for causing Tashana's death and for Mrs. Williams' injuries and to run these sentences consecutively. Tashana was violently killed and suffered in her final moments and Mrs. Williams still experiences pain. I can only wonder the thoughts that went through Tashana's head when she could no longer move. 
We're no longer breathe. She was awake and had responded to Deputy Breeden, who checked on her after the accident. And she absolutely lived long enough to know what happened to her. She knew it. Tashani's, Tashana's body absorbed so much force from Daniel Schenneberger's disregard of her life that Tashana allowed the other victim to be here and living today. Even in death, Tashana helped to save a life. For these reasons, we think that the sentences for both charges should be taken into consideration and ran consecutively for the maximum sentence in this case. This is our request of you, Judge McCarty. Please hear our cries for justice. Sense investigation, but Mr. Schienenberger's record um, in that report shows that he had previously been convicted of a drug offense, previously convicted of operating a vehicle while impaired. The BMV notes 14 prior suspensions and 18 traffic related convictions. Um, from the first time that I met Shauna's family, uh, they they consistently said that they wanted the maximum sentence in this case, trial or plea, and uh, the state of Ohio and myself support them in that request. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bono. Can we put Mr. and Minister back in the spotlight? Mr. Minister, can we put him back in the spotlight? Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, uh, may it please the court. First of all, thank you for providing me with the uh, ability to review the pre-sentence investigation beforehand. Uh, I'm certain that you've gone through it thoroughly and carefully, and I don't believe that it is exactly as Mr. Baumel has stated relative to the number of suspensions. Uh, however, be that as it may, uh, my client and his family are here to accept responsibility, uh, to accept your sentence, and we have uh, some individuals that would like to address the court also. Okay. Let's have them come up. Mr. Schanford's mother. He's going to sit back down. Let's have you come up here, ma'am. My name is Candy, I am Daniel's mom. First off, my family and I, we would like to extend our deepest sympathies to the family and the friends for the loss of Tishana. We cannot imagine the pain and the sadness that you're going through. Daniel has always been a great kid. He loves sports. He loved the MX the most. And he loved hanging out with his friends. He did great in school. He started working at 16, he went to college. But before he graduated from Kent State, he became a proud father. As an example of a supportive family member, he moved in with his parents, or my parents, to help care for his terminally ill grandfather. He was always around to lend a helping hand, replacing flooring, tearing down the shed. He 
He added stair rails for his uncle, and he helped build furniture for my, my mom, his grandmother. These are just some examples. Dan graduated where he majored in pre-med and chemistry with concentration in biochemistry. While he had lots of achievements, he also had back problems that resulted in surgery where a rod and six pins were placed in his lower back. We were concerned with how his back was healing and how he felt. Didn't once worry that this would be the beginning of Dan's addiction to pain meds. He has been fighting this battle on and off for several years. Coincidentally, his daughter had similar back surgery this past May, and her only fear was the use of prescribed pain medication because she witnessed the struggles. During Dan's incarceration, we have witnessed a transformation in Dan with all the classes and counseling that he had voluntarily attended. This scientifically educated person also found the spiritual side by attending Bible studies and encouraged other inmates as well. What Daniel did was wrong, horrific, and beyond heartbreaking for the victims and both families. There is no winner in this situation, and Daniel is taking responsibility and understands the seriousness of his actions, and we can only hope for continued progress. I can tell you throughout his battle, Dan has always been a big part of our and his daughter's lives. He was and still a good father. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schoenberger and I'm Daniel's dad, or sorry, daughter. You're his daughter. Um, hi, my name is Brooke. I'm Daniel's daughter. Daughter. I would love to express my sincerest condolences to the family and the daughter who lost her mom. I'm so very sorry. I wanted everyone to know that my dad is the most caring, funny, and understanding person who is also very smart and has always helped me with my homework at any time I needed. Even now, still continues with my medical terminology that I struggle with. He helped me through my anxiety um, I had with my recent back surgery, especially since my dad um, had basically had the same procedure. It was really tough for me. I had a lot of firsts with my dad, like teaching me to ride a bike, swimming, fishing, boating, camping, and family vacation. While we have many good memories, I've also witnessed my dad and his struggles with addiction. I never stopped believing in him because I know it's a disease and I know one day he will conquer it. All this has been very hard on me along with the rest of my family and I'm saddened for the other family. But it helps that I've seen improvements with him, and I'm so proud of him with what he's accomplished. And again, I'm sorry for the family's loss, especially to Tishana's daughter. Thank you. May we hear from Mr. Shamper at this point, Judge? deep remorse that I have now and forever. 
I have concluded that my feelings transcend far beyond anything I could possibly say. I have to confess that the time leading up to that horrific day, I wasn't living the way I should have. Being selfish, making poor decisions. I wish more than anything I can go back before that day and make the necessary changes to prevent it. I don't expect forgiveness. But I hope you can find it, not for me, but for yourself. In my pursuit to repent, I have spent a lot of time trying to learn about forgiveness. I have come to understand that forgiveness is more for the benefit of the forgiver than the forgiven. It serves to avoid becoming consumed by anger and resentment, preventing any more pain that I have already inflicted. It is a choice and not an easy one, and I struggle every day to forgive myself. I begin each day with the awareness of my past mistakes. I struggle every day to accept why it wasn't me instead. I regret. I regret over the past leads to shame, which leads to fear and anger. So I pray for God forgiveness and the strength to forgive myself. Forgiveness doesn't change the past, but it does change the power it holds on the future. The goal is not to alleviate my feelings. My goal is to use those feelings as a daily reminder to focus on character transformation and building a firewall of protection against reoccurrence. I know that mercy is not something anyone deserves based on merit. But something undeserved that someone else gives my grace. Again, to say I'm sorry doesn't come close to describing how truly sorry I actually feel. I know I have done wrong and deserve to pay the penalty. I will dedicate the rest of my life to genuine repentance and effort to pay that penalty and to produce more than just a spoken apology. Yes, briefly, Josh. I think most everything has been said. I do have a few thoughts, though, with respect to, first of all, with respect to the, the uh, videos that were played by the prosecution before I mean, obviously, given the nature of this automobile crash, my client was clearly in shock at the time that the body of camera officers were intercepting. My comments are not intended to justify Mr. Schamberger's actions. Uh, this is a relatively common story, unfortunately, throughout the state of Ohio. We, as in many other states, are suffering with opioid addiction. Mr. Schamberger is a perfect example of that. This is not an instance uh, that comports with what we typically find in cases such as this person goes to a bar, becomes voluntarily intoxicated, gets behind the wheel, and a crash ensues. As the court is well aware, this case took place at 8.30 in the morning on a work day. I've spent countless hours with my client for over a year now, and I've come to know him and believe in him. And this is a tragic circumstance could have been avoided. However, as the court is well aware, we requested a toxicology expert in order to determine what the half-life of the drugs were in his system. Had we gone to trial, and frankly, he didn't want that, nor did I, nor did anyone involved in this process. But had we, we could have shown that Mr. Schamberger, despite what some of the folks have said, did not wake up that morning, get ready to go to work, and voluntarily ingest illegal substances. As he has repeatedly said to me and to others who are involved in this process, and as I have relayed to both the prosecution and your honor, Mr. Schamberger was suffering from a residual effect from drugs 
that were contained in a vape pen which was packed or by a friend. At least 36 hours prior, he thought that he was taking a hit of cannabis, and unfortunately what happened was that cannabis was clearly laced with this vicious cocktail that everyone has spoken of, including Mr. Baumel. I apologize on my client's behalf to those friends and family members. As someone said previously, there are no words. I know that. There are no words that can possibly sell your pain. I hope that you will seek solace in your faith and in the teachings of your Lord. Also, I'd like to say, please understand that what you perceive as an indifference to your loss was in fact all my responsibility. As his counsel, I have continuously reminded my client that he must not speak to anyone, especially members of victims' family. Uh, so what you perceive as an indifference or a failure to apologize or to take accountability was actually my instruction to him in order to protect his constitutional rights. Judge, I'm certain that you read the letter that I provided from Chaplain Jarvis. As you know, there was a period of time during the dependency of this matter that my client was transferred to Medina. And at that point, he came in contact with Chaplain Jarvis and her husband, also a chaplain. And he was actively, he, Mr. Schamberger, was actively involved in ministering to other inmates and he did that of his own free will and, and because he has an interest in trying to help others. I believe that this is a, although this is a horrific, horrific day, all the way around, that Mr. Schamberger, given his education, his background, his upbringing, his values, that he does have the potential to following a, a, a reasonable punishment for these crimes. He has the ability to go out and have a positive impact on others before they end up in front of you in an orange jumpsuit. I would ask that you consider those factors in terms of evaluating the correct sentence, and I trust that you will do so. I have nothing further. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Administrator. So the court has reviewed the pre-sentence investigation. I have met with the prosecutor and defense lawyer multiple, multiple times over the course of this case, and so have heard um, continuously about um, how things have progressed and the positions of the parties and learned about uh, the families involved as well. Um, and so before I pronounce sentence, I do want to say that uh, I really want to thank the family, uh, both families, um, for sharing so much. In particular, um, for sharing so much about um, Tashana. So often in cases like this, most of the cases honestly that I handle, a lot of the focus of the judge and the lawyers, prosecutors and defense lawyers is the defendant. And what did the defendant do? And what should we do regarding the defendant? And do, you know, does he have a record? Does she have a record? You know, what's the situation as far as is he or she working? Do they have you know, an addiction? The system's just kind of set up that way when we resolve most cases that that's what happens. Of course, there's victims in many cases, and of course, I hear about their positions, but often I don't hear much. And I really don't learn much about the victims. Maybe, you know, 
they are okay with probation. They need this much restitution, but I don't ever really hear much about their character or their qualities, their personality. And so it's an important part of the total picture to hear that about Deshauna. Some victims in a situation like this, they, the family members cannot speak. They can't get up in front of a courtroom. I mean, even lawyers sometimes get nervous speaking in court and they come to court every day. So I understand how intimidating it can be and, and then of course it's so emotional that many family members simply just can't do it. So for those of you that did do it, I want to thank you uh, for your emotional strength and your courage to get up here and do that on behalf of Tashana. And likewise, when there's a defendant who's done something terrible, it's very difficult for his family to come in and try to say something too because they feel perhaps their voice isn't going to be heard. Um, but that's not the case. The court wants to hear from everyone. And I also want to thank um, Mrs. Schannenberger and Brooke for coming in and speaking as well. These cases would be so much easier if the person that was the wrongdoer was a terrible, evil person. It would really make my job so much easier. And I think in some ways it would be easier for the victim's family because of the anger and the you know, very harsh feelings that you have towards the person that stole your loved one. Uh, but you know, our, our world is not black and white, it's gray. And we have a man here who I believe not discussing his actions, but just based on the other things that I've heard, is a man of good character, who has a family, who loves him. And so I just want to note that I don't feel that you're evil or a monster. I just want you to know that. However, I'm not judging you as a person. I'm judging your actions and your actions, what the, the result of your actions was so horrific. The court has to take that into account. So, um, however, I also do want to say, you stepped forward and you resolved the case. So as difficult as this was, a trial would be so much more traumatic for the family. Everyone knows that. Having to sit through it, having to watch everything, having to see the photographs, having to totally, completely relive that day. I've seen it. It's very traumatic for families. And so in cases like these, whenever possible, I know prosecutors try to avoid the trial if it's reasonable to do so. In this situation, you pled to the indictment, essentially. The other charges were going to merge, and you pled to the highest level of the charges you were facing and threw yourself on the mercy of the court. So you did provide that level of closure to the family. There will be no extracted long trial. There will be no uncertainty about the verdict. There will be no long months of appeals. You have taken that part of this trauma away from them. And that's why I want them to understand that when someone does plead guilty to the maximum charges, because I want to encourage future defendants to have that desire to avoid that trauma for the family, that I generally do not give the maximum sentence on a plea. And so I want the family to understand that if, if that happens in part today, it's not because the court feels any less the absolute tragedy of this situation or the quality of the life that was lost, because that is not the situation. Excuse me.
My throat's very dry. It is simply, practically, acknowledging that it's a good thing to have closure. And it's a good thing for someone to accept responsibility. And the court does take that into account. In fact, honestly, that is the only thing here that is preventing me from giving the absolute maximum consecutive sentences. Despite your good character, and despite your family loving you, and despite you do have you have some record there, you do, but it's not as horrific as others. Despite all of that, that really has no effect on the court. It is the fact that you accepted responsibility is the sole reason that I'm not giving a total maximum consecutive sentence. However, um, I feel that what happened to Tashana was so awful and terrible and tragic and senseless, there's not enough words, as others have said, that it is appropriate for me to give you the maximum sentence on that charge. So I am gonna impose as to the aggravated vehicular homicide count one, eight to 12 years in the Ohio State Penitentiary. As to the aggravated vehicular assault regarding Ms. Williams, who I'm sure has gonna have her own struggles and probably has her own guilt because she didn't die, and yet she's suffered a horrific loss as well. And I didn't hear her voice today, but I'm sure this has been every measure of traumatic to her physically and emotionally. I will um, sentence you to two years in the Ohio State Penitentiary, and I will run that consecutive to the eight to 12 year sentence. On the misdemeanor, I will impose the 180 day sentence and the mandatory fine of $525. I will have to, by law, give you a mandatory lifetime um, license suspension as to count one. And there's a, I think, two to 10 year suspension. Two to 10 year suspension on count two. And two to ten on count two. And why that's happening, but just make sure we meet everybody, I guess. One to seven year suspension on count three. Those suspensions are all going to run together. Um, and so you have the lifetime suspension, which is a hard 15 years, meaning you can't even consider asking for any sort of privileges until after you've served um, 15 years of that. And there's no guarantee that it would be me. I would be the judge here at that point, but there's no guarantee that that any judge would ever restore your driving privileges. Um, now, I personally believe life is sacred, and we've lost a life here, so this is a total loss to the community. I agree, not just this family. It's a loss to the community. But you didn't die in this accident. That tells me there's a reason you're here. And I hope that reason ends up being what the chaplain from Medina County Jail said, and that maybe you're thinking, is that you can redeem yourself. You can teach others, you can help others to avoid the seriously difficult, bad choices that you made that led you here. Um, that's the only real good I see coming out of this. There's no other good. The only other thing I do want to comment on is that Tashana's family obviously is very loving. And so I know that they will wrap themselves around Melrose. And so I, I want to express my you know, sympathy about what's happened, but I also want to challenge you to do that. Not just for each other, but also for the girl who lost her life. And so I'm going to also order that you pay the cost of this prosecution, um, knowing that you're going to be incarcerated and indigent. Um, I will issue a judgment for that amount. I will not allow that to be collected at a rate greater than $5 a month. Obviously, eventually, you're going to pay that off. But while you're incarcerated, it will allow you to keep money in your commissary and function uh, without the clerk taking 
every penny every month. I'm not going to allow that to happen. So, but we'll get that money um, over a period of time. There's also, is it a mandatory fine on the F2 that I have to impose? On the misdemeanor? No. On the felony, is that a mandatory fine? I don't think it is. is no. It? no. No. I imposed $525 fine on the misdemeanor of the first degree. But, Your Honor, and I don't know if you mentioned it, but both those sentences are mandatory time. They are mandatory time. They are consecutive. I have to make the finding that consecutive sentences are necessary to punish the offender. They are not disproportionate to the seriousness of the offender's conduct and to the danger that he poses to the public. These are findings I have to make specifically. And that two of the offenses were committed as a part of a course of conduct. And the harm caused by those multiple offenses was so great or unusual that no single prison term adequately reflects the seriousness of the offender's conduct. So it's eight to 12 years plus two years. So it's a mandatory of 10 years with a possibility of an additional four. So that would be 10 to 14 years. I think I explained to you on your plea based on the indeterminate sentence that there's a presumption that you would do the minimum term of 10 years. But based on your behavior, and if the, if the ODRC feels you're still a threat for some reason or that your security, um, your security issue, they could request to have a hearing to uh, rebut that presumption and keep you in longer. Like I said, that would be a hearing you'd be entitled to have, and they would have to rebut the presumption. They could keep you in additionally for periods of time, but they could never keep you longer than the total amount of the sentence of 14 years. I'll give you credit for all the time that you have served in the Summit County Jail, and I believe as of well, let's see if that's up to today or if that was up to last week. I'll have to check that. 442 days. It's up to today. It's up to today? Okay. Um, I do wish my blessings not only on Ms. Um, Ms. Junius's family and Ms. Williams' family, but also on you, on you and on your family too, Mr. Shannon. I'm just sad that all of us had to come together under these circumstances. Right. Thank you, Mr. Jones, for standing in. All right, we'll conclude that. Thank you, Judge. Yes, Judge. Judge? Yes. Yes? He's polite. I should have asked. Sorry. I don't think he's going to talk back up.